Tim Gibson, I'm uh, the Associate Chair of the Department of Communication at George Mason University. And today's panel, I'm very pleased to bring to you our panel of uh, top papers in media criticism. Um, and uh, I'll just introduce the papers, and then my uh, colleague uh, David Miller will introduce the panelists. Um, first, we have Transgender Identity Through the Media from Bruce to Caitlin uh, by Grace uh, Novak from George Mason University. Uh, Second, we have Symbolic Tears for Crybaby, uh, delivered today by Mercy Wheeler from George Mason University. And then finally, uh, Steven Universe, A Feminist and Queer Theory Analysis uh, by Michelle Yabes, uh, also from George Mason University. So I'd like to thank all our panelists for being here today. Just one um, housekeeping note for those students who are here from this current semester's COM 380. May I see your hands? Are you here? Cool. All right. I'm going to pass around this uh, really improvised sheet if you could sign in f because I know you are here. Be not only because you want to hear these wonderful presentations, but uh, you're also here for some credit. <laughs> so, yes, if you could pass this down, that will be great. And um, I'll make an announcement at the end as well for anyone who comes in. Okay, um, well, uh, just a brief bio. Uh, today we have, um, you, on the program you'll see four people listed. Unfortunately, um, Hazel Saunders could not be here. She had a family emergency, so uh, that's why she will not be presenting today. Um, I, in no particular order, um, Michelle Ayebs is a recent cum laude graduate of George Mason University. She majored in international affairs, taking on a double concentration in global governance and media communication and culture, and minored in German. Um, Michelle was on the, dis on the dean's list for five semesters, and she was awarded twice as well for excellence in German in 2013 and 15. She was also a member of GMU's Filipino Culture Association and the Catholic Campus Ministries. And she's from Philippines and moved to Arlington, Virginia in the fall of 1997. Michelle is currently a communication and development intern at the Lewis Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law here in Washington, D.C. Next, we have Mercy Wheeler, professional. Um, she is, Mercy Wheeler has a scholarship chair of the Gender Inclusive Honors Fraternity, uh, Phi Sigma Pi, elected historian of Phi Sigma Pi in 2016 and 2017. Uh, she has been a consistent Dean's uh, List member since her freshman year onwards. She is a communication major with a minor in film with a concentration in media production and criticism. And she's right uh, from our neighborhood here in Burke, Virginia. And Grace Novak is uh, here in her last semester as undergraduate student at George Mason University, who is also majoring in communication with a concentration in media production and criticism and a minor in computer science. She's been on the dean's list at, um, at Mason from 2012 to 2015. And she's also from Burke, Virginia, uh, Virginia, um, Burke, Virginia. So why don't we just give them a hand before we begin. Hello, good morning everybody. I'm Grace, as has been said. This is my paper that I wrote for my media criticism class. So what I did was I wrote a paper on the interview between Caitlyn Jenner and Diane Sawyer, which premiered on April 24th. I believe it was ABC. It premiered to like 17.1 million viewers. It was very much reported on widely throughout the media and it caused a really big spark. So just to introduce like why I started talking about this topic, coming to Mason and coming to college is a big time <laughs> in most pe young people's lives. If you're coming you know, straight out of high school, it's a time for you discovering your identity and discovering who you are and who you want to be. And that journey is a lot harder for a lot of different people depending on the kind of person you are especially when the media that you know, you're exposed to is primarily white, primarily heterosexual, and primarily male. So if you're a white, straight male, you know, it's pretty easy. You turn on the TV and you're pretty much represented immediately. 
but you know, transgender youths, minority youths, LGBT youths are people who aren't as represented in the media. And so their journey into coming to understand their identity and be accepted by their peers is a lot harder one. So as someone who wants to be a media producer myself, I want to be you know, a professional videographer, I want to edit, I think it's important to know what exactly the media is missing and what needs to be changed so that you know, it's more representative of everybody and it's easier for you to you know, accept your peers who you haven't been exposed to before. All right, so as I said, I wrote my paper on the interview. I'm just going to show a quick clip of the promo. There we go. I'm going to have to watch this short ad. You check your oil and battery life with an app. How sci-fi is that? Dad's wheel barrel? That was his dad. Hello, arrow card. Dad's tools weren't this tough or this cordless. Imagine what Dad could have done with the tools that you have. Then imagine all you can do this way. Get this lightweight design real, the 18 volt tremor, now just $69.97. Film you. More safe, more do it. America watched him with awe in the Olympics for being the reception of the young father. And in recent years, the life you saw at all of those reality camera goals. But tonight, what we didn't see is a miracle. This is the man America knew before, a family man. There were so many photos of fatherhood. An Olympic champion, winning the 76 Olympic gold medal in the decathlon, setting a world record. Afterwards, the Weebox, and a lifetime of fame. Then came the role outside the sports arena. There was a starring role in Hollywood. And in recent years, the reality show with his wife, Chris, and their giant blended family. After all those feats, that gifted actor is now facing a new chapter in life. A chapter he said he's finally ready for. I've got my house. I've got my children. I've got family. I've got seven grandkids now. I'm actually really excited about the future, about what I could do to be able to do some real good in the world. Telling Diane exclusively about a part of his life far from the camera. What's the question you would ask me? What's the question? If I were you, what question? The man we once rooted for at the Olympics now looks to the future, worried most about his children. Those are the only ones I'm concerned with. I, I care about myself personally. And hang on, is here now. He says his concern is for his children. Okay. So that's, that was the promo. They didn't really mention her transition in the, the promo, I'm pretty sure, because um, at that point she hadn't really decided to go by the name Caitlin or to go by female pronouns. So actually the original title of my paper was From Bruce to Belinda because um, her name hadn't been revealed yet. And I think she was reporting to uh, some news outlets that it might be Belinda. But anyway, so as the promo mentioned, Caitlyn Jenner was uh, formerly Bruce Jenner, who was a former Olympic athlete, primarily known in my generation for his role on Keeping Up with the Kardashians. As you can see, they're pretty much a household name. Um, as it goes with celebrities, they are famous for being famous. So basically, you know, most people aren't really sure uh, why everybody knows who these people are. But I've never seen the show. I hear it's kind of interesting. But these are, as I said, household names. So. The interview was facilitated with Diane Sawyer, and basically it was two hours long. It spanned her discussion of coming out as a transgender woman, and at that point she wasn't going by female pronouns, but I think it was a couple weeks later when they came out with her Vanity Fair cover where it was, I am Caitlyn. So that was the first time she came out um, for, like officially as a woman. So my paper basically goes into the 
the way the media covered this, the way people reacted to this, there were some headlines where, as I wrote here from internet publication The Blaze, Bruce Jenner is not a woman, he is a sick and delusional man. This is just one example of what a lot of transgender people go through especially on the internet, which is not a nice place. And <laughs> um, the problem with Caitlyn Jenner's, uh, you know, the way that she came out through the media is that it's heavily focused on her appearance. So there is a kind of misunderstanding with how most transgender, you know, the majority of transgender youths and their experiences coming out. It's not exactly like this. I think that this is a good start because they're so invisible in the media. And I go into this through my, in my paper about studies that have been done of transgender characters in narrative fiction or uh, nonfiction. And they're usually being portrayed as villains, as sexual workers, as victims. And that's a problem because it doesn't really represent the truth about transgender people. And so I think this interview is important because it starts a conversation that a lot of people haven't had before. You know, I didn't really realize a lot of truths about transgender people until I came into college and was studying um, feminist theory, gender theory, and understanding what exactly it means to be that kind of person in our society today. And I think it's important as a creator myself to want to represent this kind of group in a more... Um, you know, in a reality that is actually true to reality. So this is another picture of Caitlin. Then I have a chart here of some of the research that I was reporting on. I didn't do this research. This is from GLAAD, which is an organization that does research on LGBTQ representation in the media. And so this is just an example of how few transgender characters are being portrayed on TV today. There are some you might know, like Orange is the New Black. There's a transgender a uh, female character who's a good representation in some ways on that TV show. But there's really not a lot. Um, it definitely hasn't even really increased at all. So I think that this is something that could be fixed in the future. Here's another example of characters that you might know who are transgender and fictional transgender characters. Another problem with uh, transgender representation, especially on narrative, film and TV is a lot of times they're not actually played by real transgender people. They're played by cis hetero people who aren't transgender at all and that's obviously an issue. So in my paper I go into basically how heteronormative representation affects our perceptions of the world and as um, Otten Mack wrote in their book on media criticism, people often turn to the media consciously or unconsciously in order to form values about the world we live in today, and those values influence the impressions we have of ourselves and of society. So basically, you know, in conclusion, it's important that we change the way we represent transgender people, not only that, but my minority groups um, on TV, because it reflects how we see the world. So you couldn't go into the world and think that there are no transgender people just because there's, they're not on TV, and I think that's big problem because it's harder to accept and understand them in this way. That's my presentation. Thank you. on here? Yeah, or, okay. Be. There you go. Okay. Um, okay, so just a very quick disclaimer. Um, this, whoops, this presentation does include uh, language and potentially disturbing imagery. It's all illustrated, but it, I don't know if it would make anyone in this room a little queasy or not. <clears throat> So my presentation is on Cry Baby by Melanie Martinez. Uh, this was the debut album that was released in August 15th, 2015. Uh, it's a concept album that follows the narrative of the titular protagonist, Cry Baby. Martinez reported in, her, in, a, in an interview that Cry Baby was meant to be a fairy tale version of herself. Not a full representation of Martinez's life, but rather a character in a story. Like most stories, symbolism plays a key role in both driving the narrative and adding depth to any derived meaning of the story. 
By studying the symbolism in Kribe with semiotic theory, a deeper analysis of both the story and potential social commentary embedded into the story can be achieved. Semiotic theory allows the study of meaning and communicated symbols and the potential decoded meaning based on the receiver's interpretation of the information. Essentially, this album is music as storytelling. It is actively telling a story of Crybaby. Um, and while Martinez did not intend to write a social commentary on any particular one thing, she did derive a lot of the concepts and ideas for her album uh, from her own experiences, from her own childhood experiences especially, and her own experiences as a young woman. Uh, she was 20 years old at the time of the release, and all of the lyrics were written by herself with some help with producers. Um, there's depth and multiple meanings in every line, and it assists in the narrative of the story and the resulting <laughs> analysis, particularly of childhood and femininity. In addition to lyrical and, and instrumental symbolism, there's a visual component to the, to the album. In the physical copy, there's a baby board book, essentially, and each track has its own illustration. The first group of songs, Crybaby, Dollhouse, and Sippy Cup, introduce Crybaby and her home life. Crybaby is introduced as an emotional, tearful, friendless girl who knows far too much about all the issues that are found in her family. They're determined to hide their personal problems behind a fake plastic sheen to protect any outsiders from knowing what's going on. In Dollhouse and Sippy Cup, it's revealed that Crybaby's mother is an alcoholic due to her husband's infidelity. This, among other dysfunctions in her family, leads to her mother in the story murdering the father and hiding the, de and hiding the deed from her children. And this is a clip from, oh, we're going to watch an ad first. All right, so uh, this is the music video for Sippy Cup. We're just going to watch, we're just going to listen and watch to a couple of seconds, so I won't uh, expand it too, uh, too much. If taken less literally and more interpretively, symbolically dead and corpse could mean emotionally disappeared or unwilling to participate in the facade of a perfect family life. The father is still having an affair even though his wife is drinking to forget it, and perhaps there was an attempt to save the crumbling relationship with the child. The corpse in the cradle that, fail that failed to save it, probably crybaby herself. Even if the pretty facade is added, conflict and trauma exist behind the surface. The themes of facades and denial in the face of trauma is reoccurring. Crybaby's life is at some level determined by her home life and personal trauma. Dollhouse and Sippy Cup also introduce the relatively unique instrumental factor of Crybaby, at least in comparison to other mu mainstream music releases. Martinez uses vintage toy sound effects throughout the album, intentionally juxtaposing cheerful and familiar sounds of childhood against lyrics to describing ugly, uncomfortable adult situations and feelings. Toy pianos especially are a common sound throughout the album. Carousel, Alphabet Boy, Soap, and Training Wheels are about romantic relationships, all with underlying problems. Carousel, with low horns and accordions to create a carnival atmosphere, which was also featured in the trailer for American Horror Story, uh, <laughs> describes a relationship that feels like a carousel. He heaps her at a distance, but, at a distance, but strings her along in circles to make her believe it'll come closer. Alphabet Boy is about a boy that does not take Crybaby seriously because she's older and more educated. This particular song uses alliteration in order to show her own uh, unique take on lyrics using alliteration and alphabet. So.
<clears throat> the alliteration is clever and brings attention to the prove you wrong mentality that Crybaby has in response to the situation. An immature response, but probably accurate for the age range that she's supposed to be representing. But it does also show that metaphorically she knows her ABCs even when she's writing her lyrics. In Soap, Crybaby tries to hide her feelings towards another boy that she likes, comparing her sudden confession to a faucet running. She wants to retract her confession and erase it entirely with soap as if she had spoken a profanity. Trading Wheels is the only true love song of the album, and even so, it's not necessarily about a healthy relationship. Crybaby mentions that she loves it when the boy calls her dumb for the stupid things that she does. When put in the context of Crybaby and the rest of the lyrics, however, it sounds like she's willing to ignore potentially abusing, abusive and unloving words as long as she's allowed into an intimate relationship. Training Wheels also has music box sounds whoops, uh, throughout the song, reinforcing the idea of childhood and sounds indicating childlike behavior. The centerpiece and single of the album, the original single of the album, is Pity Party. This was fitted together with the sample of the 1965 song by Leslie Gore, It's My Party. In the original song, the singer describes her distress and sadness that her boyfriend has arrived to a party in the company of another girl. In, part, in Pity Party, not only has Crybaby's boyfriend not shown up, but nobody else came either. This is the turning point of the album. In Martinez's own words, this is the part where Crybaby goes crazy. Tag Your It utilizes metaphors like cut you up and make you dinner and took the words right out my mouth for a sexual assault. Martinez sings for Crybaby in her attacker when the assailant's voice pitched down and added noise, creating a distorted and frightening effect. Milk and Cookies describes Crybaby's murderous revenge on her attacker by feeding him spoiled milk and drugged laced cookies. Pacify Her shows how Crybaby... Oh. I'm missing a slide. <laughs> Pacify her, it shows how Crybaby no longer feels empathy for others and only wants to hurt them by ruining their relationships. The illustration for this one is essentially she's pushing a pacifier, pacifier, her, pacifier her into another girl's mouth. Mrs. Potato Head is one of the most lyrically complex tracks on the album and discusses the futility of cosmetic plastic surgery. This particular track illustrates the, natu the naturally unattainable norms for female beauty and youth. And we're going to listen to just a few. My apologies for the loud volume, by the way. <laughs> um, Martinez doesn't appear to pass a negative or positive judgment on the act, however. Simply acknowledging that it exists and why it exists, cosmetic changes only for the reason that there is high value placed on beauty in women. Mad Hatter is the final track of the album and uses references from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, including the title, which is a common text to reference to when talking about perceived madness or strangeness. She mentions skinny dipping rabbit holes for fun and getting drunk with a blue caterpillar to illustrate deviant ideas in the terms of a regular social society. Uh, similar to Alice, Crybaby begins the album crying, flooding in the, the tears flooding around her around in the illustration, and ends with the acceptance of her surroundings in an attempt to make some twisted sense of them. She makes a, a, a decision a little bit different from Alice in the book. Um, in conclusion, when listening, to the con when listening to concept albums like Crybaby, to have a full and analytical experience, one must consider the symbolism and multiple meanings that can be found in the lyrics, instrumentation, and video components. The reason that I really wanted to analyze this album in particular was because there is a significant lack in mainstream music for concept albums that tell a narrative story. And music is not necessarily seen as a format that can use... Uh, that can tell a narrative story anymore. Singles are more common. A lot of the, a, very, very commonly, uh, artists are uh, the word completely discouraged from 
uh, creating concept albums that have narratives because they do not sell as well as albums with singles. However, I wanted to show that it is still possible to have a narrative concept album. And Martinez, her whole idea of what make, makes music so great uh, is the storytelling aspect. In a 2015 interview, she said the following about the album and the rest of uh, basically the concept of the album. In the music business, you can't be soft about things. I've gotten better about that, but it's been very hard for me because I'm very emotional. And then in a later interview, she stated that all of her music, the goal is to tell a story. The goal is to tell a story, and all, of her, and all the rest of her albums, she hopes, will be connected to Cry Baby, as in it will tell a narrative story. It's this individual and personal understanding of both storytelling and taking concepts like childhood and insecurity that makes Cry Baby such a wonderful album. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Yabez. Um, today I'll be talking about the paper I did last spring on Steven Universe through a feminist and queer analysis. Um, here's a basic outline of my presentation. Um, today I'll be talking briefly about the show premise and its themes, um, then we'll move on to uh, the feminist analysis and talking about a couple episodes, and then I'll move on to queer analysis and we'll be using um, three episodes of it as examples and the implications that representation in the show has and the conclusion. Um, in my paper, I argued that, or I attempted to analyze elements of Steven Universe through feminist and queer analysis or theory. And I argued how the subversion of hegemonic ideas and themes in the show and its diverse representation uh, can positively impact its young audience. So the show premise and its themes, it centers around a young boy, Steven. Um, he is not quite like other young boys as he is half human and half gem. Um, gems in the show's canons is are a, a race of extraterrestrial magical beings that um, are named after their gems that are inlaid on their bodies. They can project them, their forms and change them as at their own will. And they possess multiple abilities, such as summoning weapons from their gems, um, super strength, super speed, and they can fuse with each other, just to name a few. Um, while they are, while they can project any form they wish onto themselves, they use feminine pronoun, pronouns and mostly take on feminine forms or appear to be um, female. And even though they do this, they are inherently sexless, and they do not have a concept of gender. Um, with the exception being Steven. Uh, Steve, the one important element of the show is that Steven's mother gave up her physical form to give birth to him, and the show is pretty much a coming, his coming of age story. It follows him as he tries to find his own way to harness his power as a gem, his identity between seeing himself as a human and a gem, uh, the relationships he has with his uh, gem, or the gems he lives with that primarily raise him, Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl, as well as the other res residents of Beach City, and the intersection of his own world as he sees it and reality. 
So some interesting things to note about the show was that when it first came out in 2013, the creator, Rebecca Sugar, became the first sole woman creator on Cartoon Network, and Cartoon Network was about 21 or 22 years old at the time. So it was a long time coming. Um, Steven is a non-traditional male lead. He does not adhere to hegemonic ideas of masculinity, and I'll talk more about this as I go on in the presentation. Another interesting thing to note is that the cast has a wide, diverse um, range of body types in their characters on screen, and with the actors be behind the mic, there's also a wide range of diversity. So um, the reason I decided to do this paper was the sh it, oh, sorry, I was drawn to the show as it was really positive and I found it really unique and I thought it would be really interesting to analyze it through some of the concepts we learned in class. So um, with the feminist analysis of media, I'll be discussing some of the terms that Jill, uh, Ro Rosalind Jill talks about in her article, Post-Feminist Media Culture. So first off, um, I note that this show does not typically, or does not adhere to typical, the typical separation of the sexes, sexes or notion that there's a natural difference between the sexes. And Jill states in her article that this would be, that this is very uncommon as it's as a separation of the sexes or the notion of a different, the difference between them is common in most media. And she, she notes that this is a key feature of what she calls post-feminist sensibility. And this assumption that there is a se separation of the sexes is that there is a natural discourse between the sexes and that men and women are fundamentally different. Um, and it's also the idea that men and women do not just, just do not understand each other. As Jill describes, this idea is present and perpetuated throughout many various forms of media and constructs a deeper divide between masculinity and femininity, as well as re-eroticizes the power relations between men and women. She goes on to say on page 159 that the natural de that a notion of a natural difference between genders can freeze existing inequalities by rep representing them as inevitable. However, this is not the case in the show. Um, one example I use is the episode Giant Woman. At the onset of the episode, Stephen finds out that gems have the ability to fuse and turn into a bigger gem, and he thinks he's never seen this before, so he's really excited and he wants um, Pearl and Amethyst to fuse because he wants to see their fusion opal. And throughout the episode, he's singing about how he would really want to see them even, and um, saying this one line, if it were me, I would really want to be a giant woman, <laughs> trying to convince them that they should fuse. And as you can see, when he finally does see the fusion, he's in awe, he, he's really happy, um, showing that he has a, this great admiration for them. And by, by saying that, that, oh, I would want to be a giant woman if I were you, he is pretty much showing that he doesn't see this difference of the sexes or he doesn't think that there's a shameful divide between them. So this is the way that Rebecca Sugar plays with gender in the show is intentional. In a interview that came out after I finished my paper, she meant she when she was asked about this, she confirmed it saying, yes, it's completely intentional. Her, her, one of her goals for the show was to tear down and play with the semiotics of genders in children's cartoon, cartoons. Because she pretty much says that when she was younger, she didn't really understand how, like, there would, that she wasn't allowed to enjoy boy shows, but she did as a girl. And so she wanted to use the show as a vehicle to play with that and to show that everyone can enjoy a form of media no matter what their gender is. And that, the, that idea that there's a separation of the genders is absurd. Another thing Jill talks about in her article is the idea of femininity as bodily property. And she defines this bodily property as the idea that a woman's value is put into um, pretty much what her, what her body, it's, the same, it's seen as the sole source of her identity and perhaps the sole key to her identity. 
She notes how post-feminist media culture is obsessive in its preoccupation with the body. And as a result, women's bodies are constantly monitored, they're constantly under surveillance, disciplined, and remodeled in order to we conform to ever narrow ju narrower judgments of female attractiveness. So in the show Steven Universe, um, the, it, includes, it includes a wide range of different body types for um, each of its female characters and its entire cast in general. The body image of each female character is not discussed as a point of their, or made a central point of their identity, nor is it shown to be in the, the factor that is how they identify themselves with. Um, the one occurrence that there was uh, an, an objective statement made about a female body was committed by a minor character and he was immediately berated for this comment. In the episode story for Stephen, Stephen's father re retells how he met his mother. And at one point in the episode when he's talking to his former friend and manager about how he's so in love with Stephen's mother's mother Rose, his friend responds with a comment like he, did, he didn't understand and says, see Greg, this is your problem. You want one huge woman when you could have multiple smaller ones. To which he responds in disgust, of oh, Marty, women are people. And shortly afterwards, um, the friend Marty is kicked out of his van and Greg drives home to Beach City. Let's see, oops, I... And the next thing I discussed in my paper is the idea of the ritual of rebellion that um, Wester Fellhouse and La Crooks talk about in their article, Seeing S Straight Through Queer, Queer Eye, Expo Exposing the Strategic Rhetoric of Heteronormativity in a Mediated Ritual of Gay Rebellion. So pretty much a ritual of rebellion grants their participants temporary license to vol violate selected social cultural rules. And in doing so, they provide a much needed, needed outlet for expressing and relieving s social tensions. However, rather than threatening to, threatening the dominant order such as, or threatening the dominant order, such rituals actually promote the so social stability as they, even though they seem to challenge it. So he goes on to say that these, that the header, hegemonic values end up being reaffirmed and reasserted and, the, and as well as the social structure of the dominant order. He also goes on to say that um, queer, they also go on to say that queer shows are often formulated through a ritual of rebellion, rebellion that are filled with tactile and verbal transgressions that stop short of overt homosexuality. So this formula, they discuss how this formula um, imposes constraints and restraints that that prohibit any critiques or um, complaints from being made. And in the show, they use the example how, or in the article, they use the example how in the show that the Fab Five they could like high five or like pet other the straight men they were helping, but they could never do anything like overtly sexual, like kiss them or anything like that. So the first, so earlier episodes of Steven Universe do, do fall into these ritual of rebellion where they don't, they just stop short of making any explicit queer, um, of showing any explicitly queer aspects. However, later episodes further develop them. So in the first episode um, that I talked about as an example is Alone Together. In this episode, Steven accidentally fuses with his best friend and crush Connie and they form Stevani who is this tall, slender person, and when she, they are walking around Beach City together, they, um, many of, like, pretty much all of the adolescents in the town find them very attractive. Uh, Stevani's gender is not explicitly stated throughout the episode, but um, later on, the, one of the writers for the show confirmed on Twitter that um, Stevani uses they and them pronouns. In the next episode, Rose's scabbard, Pearl is implied to have very strong to have had very strong romantic feelings for Rose. Speaking about her with the highest respect, she, when asked about what um, she was like by Stephen, she goes on to say that she was intelligent and she was beautiful, and she blushes when she's talking about her. She also becomes visibly upset and insulted 
when the closeness of their relationship, when she feels the closeness of their relationship comes into question. And she later states in the episode, everything I did, I did for her. The most explicit relationship described in the show um, at the time this paper was written was that of Garnet. We find out in the season one fi finale that she's actually a fusion herself between the gems Ruby and Sapphire. Um, in this episode, the crystal gems and Steven are taken are taken into um, are captured by homeworld gems that are hostile towards the planet, and um, Garnet ends up being split up by Jasper, and we don't know how long um, Ruby and Sapphire were together before this, but Ruby is ob obviously upset when they are separated and when they're trying to find each other. Um, with Steven's help, they find each other. And in this um, clip, I'll show you. Um, we can see how much they care for each other and we're, ex we're happy to be reunited. That is not the right one. Oh, okay. Oops. Sorry, I haven't used a, anything that's not a Mac in a long time. Oops. Oh, here we go. Sorry about this. So, yeah, so they see each other after being separated and run into each other's arms and, oh. I'm okay. Did they hurt you? Who cares? I do. <laughs> So as you can see that they were very happy to see each other and um, you could see just how much they cared for each other and how happy they were to be reunited again. So the implications of, oops, of representation. So Gray talks about how television can provide a visual representation for the unknown and is often the only means for how one group is informed about one another. Um, representation in the media can have a profound impact on how we view ourselves and how we view others by constructing images that can either perpetuate or dismantle stereotypes and ideologies. Um, so in an, in an article by Brian Shelter for the NYC, or NY Times, um, he quotes a professor of a communi communications at the University of Minnesota who, sim who simply says that TV and movie representation matters. Um, he found in five separate studies that the presence of gay characters on television programs decreases pre pre prejudices among viewers about, of the program. He, um, and a blogger may um, discusses this as well in in a post she made, she said that kids see them see people like them positively portrayed in the media they consume. They are positively positively impacted, and they don't see. And when they don't see the same representation, it negatively affects not only them but how others view and treat people like them. In the same art, or in the article by by Brian Shelter, um, he takes a quote from Chaz Bono, the first transgender man to 
compete on Dancing with the Stars, who says, if someone like me was on TV when I was growing up, my whole life would have been different. So in conclusion, um, as I described in this presentation, Steven Universe is, is one of the unique cartoon shows of today that is, attempts to subvert hegemonic ideas and themes. Um, the way the show's creators attempt this is through the positive depiction of the re re relationship between sexes and not reinforcing the idea of inherent um, sexual discourse as well as criticizing those ideas. It also showcases non -heter it also sh showcases overt, non-heteronormative themes and queer characters. Thus, the representation and the normalization of these aspects, as they're never questioned within the show, um, can positively impact how the audience views themselves and other groups. And that's all I have. That's <laughs> but, um, and Steven is rerunning on Sundays if anyone wants to watch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, about <coughs> questions. So, any questions for any of our panelists? Yeah. If our panelists would come up to the front. There we go. a lot of her own experiences. She identified as a very emotional child when she was growing up. She was relatively friendless. She was bullied very often. Um, so she drew in a lot of her own experiences. But some of the songs like Tagurate and Milk and Cookies mm -hmm. never happened. They were, con they were basically responses to uh, what kind of narrative she wanted to tell, uh, kind of juxta juxtaposing uh, childhood themes with dark and ugly themes like murder or sexual assault. Uh, back there. Personally, I think because she drew on her own personal experiences, there has to be some sort of meaning, there has to be some sort of commentary on it just because she is drawing from her, from her own experiences and from what she has seen as she's grown up. Um, I think that if she had, there was a lot of good, uh, there was lots of good reviews for the album itself. One of the reviews that wasn't so good did mention that because it was a concept album, it might not sell as well, it might not be as popular. Um, but I think that there's really a desire for narrative storytelling in music because we are so used to hearing the same sort of love songs over and over again, like very, uh, very same old, same old. So I think I think that it wouldn't. It might have sold. It might have sold better, but it may not have done as well uh, as an analytical or, intele or intellectual property. Yeah. Melanie Martinez.
find something that isn't. So is there a reason you start to them? Like, do you think they are all things that do take a good position on these? Well, oh. for me, um, I think I picked mine because it was mainstream, because I wanted to find something that represented transgender identity in the media that reached out to as many people as possible. Like I said, it reached you know, 17 million viewers. So because of that, I think it shows not only the, the good of showing transgender identity on TV, but the bad of it, and how, like I said, Caitlyn Jenner is definitely not the best transgender um, role model, not, not at all. But you know, it shows that we're starting to talk about it, and that's why that's, it was important for me. Um, for me, I picked Steven at first because um, I really liked the show, and I saw how it intersected with a lot of things we were talking about in class. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, Steven wasn't as popular as it is um, this year, and th the show didn't develop a lot of its themes until now. Um, <coughs> like now they have more episodes that are more overt, overt and I would have loved to use it have used as examples, but um, the re the I guess the reason I picked it was because it was so positive, and um, as a child, I didn't see that many shows that were positively depicting anything that wasn't like heteronormative or like hegemonic, so I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I picked Crybaby because uh, I think it's really important for albums and media in general that uses non-mainstream ideas to break into the mainstream because if the concepts are not brought up in a way that is digestible by the general public, at least at some level, then those ideas probably won't be able to be break, broken through uh, just in general. So at the time that I wrote The Sleeper, there wasn't um, anything about it because the show was still relatively new. Um, <coughs> but right now, I'm not sure if they're still if they're trying to develop a study to look at this. But um, I've read just like unofficial like blog posts and things and like articles from people on the internet, and mm -hmm. they comment on how um, this could be like great for kids and like. Um, young people, I've seen like writings from young people who are like, I'm seeing myself in this show and I've never seen myself before and I find this, this is great. But as far an, as an official study, I don't know yet. I'd like to see one if it does come out. But. process question, not specific to the paper that you've written, but um, what advice would you give to students taking media criticism now in terms of, you know, finding a, finding a, a topic and doing the research? All of your papers seem to be very well researched. Um, do you have any suggestions that for the rest of us? Um, I think it's important to pick a topic that you like and that you're interested in. I don't think don't pick something because you think it's going to be easy or maybe it's popular right now, but I think it's important that this is a topic that's interesting to you and that's important to you because it gives you more of a motivation to like actually seek out and do the research. It's more of a fun experience. Um, yeah, definitely. Do something that you actually care about. <laughs> um, my personal suggestion would be don't be afraid to use... Um, sources that you don't necessarily would think w that you don't necessarily would think would be relevant to what you're talking about. Synthesize what you know and synthesize what knowledge you may be able to bring to the table, even if it's not necessarily directly uh, involved with the subject at hand. So I actually went out and I did some research on like childhood development theories and what might have like what might have caused this. Like even if it's a fictional narrative. There are still underlying themes and consequences that we see in the real world that 
end up being translated into narrative fiction. Yeah, I'm just going to echo what they said. Definitely pick something that you're interested or passionate about um, because half of the paper is, the motivation for the paper is just because you're interested in learning more and putting what you want together. And um, yeah, for me, it was like I had to synthesize a lot of information that wasn't directly related to Stephen. There was no like specific academia on it at the time. Um, so I def definitely had to pull from different resources, and you'll probably have to do that too. But um, finding out more information is is like half the fun when it's when it's something you're passionate and interested about. Well, I want to thank. Uh, first of all, let's have a round of applause for our three panelists. Thank you so much. <coughs> it was uh, to see not only the excellent presentations, but how they interwove together, all addressing issues related to sexuality and uh, and gender in media. So, uh, thank you again for your questions and for attending and participating. And uh, I think this room is closed until after lunch. But please come back after lunch at at twelve thirty. And uh, we have uh, at least two yeah. more sessions of panels to, to come after lunch. So we'd more media to in that and More media in this room, right? Um, or is it? No, D. <laughs> Let me find we out. We've got a plug for um, the, our other universities. These were all Mason, but we have. Uh,